case you didn't hear at the end, that's Derek Carr starting quarterback for the Los Angeles Raiders. Derek Carr about a month ago signed the largest contract in NFL history, making him the richest player in the NFL. And the first thing that Derek Carr did with his brand new contract was at a press conference, let everybody in the room know that the first check he's writing is a tithe to his local church. I'm not talking about tithing today. I thought it was a cool way to set, talk about them. Um, I love his personality. How many of you, when you were growing up, uh, there was a, a personality that you really resonated with? Maybe it's a teacher. Uh, maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was a coach. And just their personality kind of shaped who you wanted to be. Um, it, you know, it could be the athlete, and you thought, man, look at the way they walk. Look at the way they carry themselves. It could be somebody that you looked up to their sense of fashion. You thought, man, I wish I could dress like that. Or I wish I could, uh, you know, if there was somebody that just was really great in, in the way they communicated. And like, man, I wish I could, I wish I was smooth and, and talked like that. We can fall in love with personalities, can't we? And we can, we can then begin to emulate them and we almost copy them uh, without telling them, you know, and you know that, uh, you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery, but we begin to imitate who they are when we find people that we want to make role models. And many of you, you've, you've done this. You've, um, you've taken on people's slogans and you, you say things that they say, or maybe you try to dress like they dress. And uh, when we begin to look at those personalities, one of the most important things that we see in, in Scripture as we kind of parallel how that personality works in Scripture is that we want to see personalities in Scripture that we can emulate. And in the first century, when the Apostle Paul comes into the scene and he begins teaching the principles of Jesus, he realized that there was a deficit in the early church of personality. He realized that people weren't able to connect with someone that was real, someone that they could buy into, that they could, that they could resonate with. And, and so Paul understanding human nature, and many of you, you know this about your own nature, is that we don't naturally drift into good direction, do we? We don't naturally drift into healthy disciplines. We don't naturally drift in a good direction. We have to prioritize and discipline ourselves to get there. That's our, that's our main idea today is we don't naturally drift toward good directions. I mean, I could probably ask any of you in the room, it doesn't take a whole lot of discipline for you to sit on your couch and eat a bag of Doritos. Like we just, we, we naturally can do that. Like, wow, this is, this is great. Many of us, we don't wake up in the morning and, and just naturally gravitate toward wanting to work out or wanting to go for a run or prioritizing our meals or even on a more important view. Many of us don't schedule, when am I gonna read the scriptures today? When am I going to set some time away to get away and just pray? When am I going to connect with someone in the church that maybe I haven't seen in a few weeks? Or maybe I'm going to step outside of my own comfort zone and, and, and pray for a coworker. Many of us, we don't drift toward those directions oftentimes. We have to discipline ourselves to get up early and work out, to get up early and, and, and meal plan, to get up early and say, I'm, I'm going to pray you know, at this time, or I'm going to read my word at lunch, or I'm going to connect with someone. We, we have to discipline and prioritize ourselves to get there. And so when the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, he realizes that the early church doesn't have a whole lot of people that they can emulate, that they can kind of connect with. Paul realizes that the principles he's teaching are only going to be as valuable as the personality that he is. And so he understands that principles need a personality. They need somebody to be able to look at, to connect with, to be able to say, hey, I'm going to watch what he does and I'm going to copy it. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn there with me or you can uh, look on the screen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says something that oftentimes we kind of just read it and almost just overlook it, but the depth behind the statement is real. It was, it was so far ahead of its time, and it was such an incredible statement to make. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and it's such an amazing thing I want to look at today. Paul says this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, Paul is saying that Jesus is my example. But I know that Jesus, who, who was here, 
who was crucified and resurrected on the third day and then ascended into heaven with over 500 people seeing him ascend into heaven. He is not here. He is sending his Holy Spirit. But you need to have somebody on earth that you can watch their example. And so Paul puts himself in front of everybody and says, watch me. Christ is my foundation. Watch me. Because haven't there been people that you've, that you've, not in a jealous way or an envious way, but haven't there been people that you've watched and, and, and you say, man, I wish, I, I, I wish my marriage looked like their marriage. And not that I want his wife, not that I want his husband. I'm not saying that. I just want my marriage to look like their marriage. And so you begin to say, I want to I pray for that. And I, and I want that. Again, not in an envious way or a jealous way. How many of you have said, man, I, I just, I, I want to parent the way they parent. And just look at the way they don't overreact and, and, and they, don't, you know, they, don't, they don't freak out when things happen. I remember the first time, um, uh, how many of you tend to be a bit on the organized OCD end? Anybody in the room? Okay, just a few of you that you can, can resonate with me. I remember the first time, um, and Beth always says this, you know, I, I can be a bit overly organized and, and routine driven and want things done in a certain way and everything has to be at right angles and straight and Beth loves me, you know, in, in spite of that flaw. And I remember the first time that Brooklyn spilled something. She's like two, and I got mad at her. <laughs> and Beth went, she's two. She's like, relax. <laughs> and I'm like, so um, I, have, I have since relaxed, because kids make messes. And, and, uh, and being, a, being a parent is the perfect training ground for being a pastor, because you make messes. <laughs> and if I freak out every time you make a mess, uh, we'd have a lot smaller church. <laughs> And so when the Apostle Paul comes onto the scene and he says, follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ, he was saying, hey, watch, watch me. Watch what I'm doing. I'm putting myself in front of all of you so that you'll be able to see what I have gleaned from what Jesus has taught me. And I want to teach that to you. Because we all have personalities that we resonate with. And Paul comes on the scene and says, hey, there's some godly principles that I want you to begin to learn and to adopt into your life. And I want you to see my personality come through. And I want you to copy me. And so I want to talk about that for a few minutes today. And here's how I want to break that down a little bit. Um, Hopefully it's memorable for you. But the way that Paul wanted us to follow his example was by first believing in the example of Jesus to believe in the example of Jesus. And then once we believe in the example of Jesus, we become an example of Jesus. So let's look at that just for a few moments. To believe in the example of Jesus. When Jesus rolled onto the scene, there there had not been a a word of God. There had not been um, a, a prophetic uh, move of God in in a season. It had been it had been a minute. It had been a while. And so when Jesus shows up on the scene, they were so hopeful for a Messiah. They were so hopeful for God to speak. And so when Jesus began to connect with people, even though, and you've heard me say this, even though he was the most holy, righteous, godly person, and he could point out all of your sins. You ever met somebody that, like, you know, that, that, that you, that, that you are, are, like, just so impressed with and that, you know, you don't measure up with and you almost feel intended to be around them? And, and as they live their life, you're kind of like, man, I'm just pond scum. You know, I'm just like the worst person ever. You know, I'm like, man, Jesus was the most holy, righteous, godly person. And he's interacting with the most unholy, unrighteous, ungodly people. But yet he included them. He made them feel welcomed. He didn't make them feel distant or shut off or cold. And so what Jesus says when he uh, rolls into town is in John chapter 8, verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light. And so what Jesus wants to do is he wants to create community. He wants to create a sense where people are gathering together in a sense of spiritual community to strengthen them in a way they wouldn't be able to do on their own. He was so real. About 15 years ago, how many of you have ever come up with your own like acronym? Like, you know, when, when you, hopefully you know what acronym is. And, and, and so I remember a few years ago, uh, uh, a youth pastor friend of mine, he showed up and he goes, man, I'm just, tell, I'm just telling everybody I want to be real. And I'm like, all right, that's great. Be real, man. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to be real. And he broke it down, R-E-A-L. And he said, I want to be relational. 
I'm like, that's great, man. That's super. I want to be encouraging, edifying to those around me. He's like, R, E. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up what you're, what you're saying now. So he's like, I want to be relational. I don't want to be encouraging. He wants, I want to be accepting. And I want to be loving. I want to be real. And when we begin to break that down, Jesus was so real with those around him. He was relational, not religious. He was encouraging, not discouraging. He was accepting. Now listen, accepting does not mean approving, right? I mean, there are people that you know are, are not living according to God's word. They're living contrary to God's word. It doesn't mean that you can't accept them right where they are. You're not approving of what they're doing. You're letting them know, hey, I want to be real with you. I accept you, but it doesn't mean you approve of them. And then lastly, you're, you're loving that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And so Jesus was just so real. And so what he does is he says, I want to create this culture of Christians in community, and I'm going to call it the church. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, and I tell you, all right, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus begins to mention building his church and the power behind the church. I love the, uh, the message translation of Matthew 16, 18. I want to read this with you. It says in Matthew chapter 16, 18, the message translation says, I will put together my church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to be kept out. Have you ever been somewhere, maybe a board meeting or a weekly staff meeting, or dear God, hopefully not a church service, that was just devoid of any energy? Have you ever been there? And, and don't you just sit there and go, oh my goodness, I just want to fall asleep. You ever been there? Real quick, this is confession time. If there's any other place you can confess, it would be church. Um, you've, you've fallen asleep in school. Let me see your hands up. You've fallen asleep in school. Okay, one of my children did, one of my children did not, okay? <laughs> You've fallen asleep in school. You've fallen asleep at work. Let me see. Okay, all right. It's awesome. Anybody have a driving job? You fell asleep while driving. Okay, you got that. All right, last one. And this is, this, you, got, you got to be honest. You've fallen asleep at church. <laughs> You've fallen asleep at Victory Church. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness wow need, I need to speak better I want to be a church that's so full of energy first of all you don't fall asleep but that people understand that this is a place where we go and it fuels me for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday battle I'm about to face because in the same vein where Jesus says, I'm building my church and on this rock, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Satan also has a strategy for the local church. Did you know that? That our adversary has an agenda for the local church. John chapter 10 verse 10 spells that out for us. In John chapter 10 verse 10 it says, that The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That the very first thing that Satan's goal for the local church, for the local believer, is to steal. To snatch you from the local community of the church. One of the things that I've uh, began to process and pray for all of us in the room is that it's very difficult to get stolen when you're serving. Amen? Because what happens when you serve, first of all, you become the greatest. You become the greatest in the eyes of Jesus when you serve. But also when you're serving, you're within that community of believers where all of a sudden you're encouraging each other. You're, you're doing, you're doing uh, the, the work and the will of God when you are doing some incredible things. And so for a few minutes this morning, I want to kind of unpack for you some areas where we have opportunities for you to step up and serve. On a given weekend, we see between 50 and 60 people serve, and that's not staff, that's not those that, you know, that get a paycheck to come to Victory Church. We see between 50 and 60 people serve, uh, from, from greeting to our kids area, to our worship team, to the sound and the tech, and there's a couple of areas that I want to begin for our church to take a next step, a, a level of growth in, because here's why, I know that we can. 
This, this whole series we're in right now is called I Can. And so often we, we limit ourselves by saying we can't, but I believe that we as a church can say I can do this because uh, about a month ago we hosted our, our sixth annual community weekend. And on that weekend, we saw more than 1,100 people step foot on our grounds. Think about that for a moment. We saw over 120 people serve at least one hour. That's amazing to see that. And so what I would begin to pray for at our church is that I want us to go from seeing between 50 and 60 people serving on a weekend to seeing over 70, 80 people serving on a weekend. So how do we do that? What are some steps that we can begin to take to do that? So in just a moment, Pastor Dan's gonna come and he's gonna share uh, some exciting news about our kids' ministry, our family life ministry, from our student ministry to our kids' ministry. But I also want us to look at some areas that you could step up and serve in. Maybe you'd say, uh, I want to serve on the worship team. I want you to connect with Pastor V. Maybe you'd say, you know, I, I would love to step up and I want to be a greeter. I want to be somebody that, that, that opens the door, that, that is a first impression. Do you know that they say um, on, a, on a given weekend when someone attends a church for the very first time, do you know who determines that first time guest experience and, and their overall experience of the church? The, door, the person opens the door. The person that opens the door, the greeter, but one of the things that we want to do on an even better level, and I talked to a gentleman yesterday, is Donnie in the room? Is, is Donnie uh, right there? Donnie in the back row. Um, I talked to Donnie yesterday, and what we're going to do is we're going to work on developing a parking lot greeting team. Uh, and if you have just a, uh, could you could you roll this footage? Uh, I want you to see it, then I'll explain it. Would you just roll this just for a moment? All right, that was Beth and I taking Brooklyn to Cedarville. That was a 10 second clip of about two minutes of their students welcoming incoming freshmen and welcoming returning students to Cedarville. Now, we, not, we may not have the energy of a 19 year old, somebody say amen. <laughs> but you know what we can have? We can have the enthusiasm and the welcoming nature to say to people that are coming to our church, we're glad you're here. Welcome. So I talked to Donnie, and we're going to put together a parking lot greeting team where when people roll in, we're going to greet them from the parking lot. And I try to do that almost weekly. Because when you're giving kids high fives and you're meeting people in the parking lot, you're letting them know this is a great place to be. Because how many of you know that when you roll out of bed sometimes it may be cold or gray? Um, in Ohio, you may experience all four seasons from nine to noon. You don't know. <laughs> You may have woke up and it's nice and sunny and on your way to church you get in a foul mood because it starts to rain, then it looks like snow, and then leaves are falling and you're in a bad mood before you get in the parking lot. Well, we want to change that. We want to make sure you know that. Uh, I do want to share just a moment of bragging on you as a church. And you need to hear this. I sat down with a missionary last weekend and I said, could, could you just tell us the state of how, how are churches doing in America? He's been to 80 churches in the last 12 months. And he says, what we saw this morning, we aren't seeing on every, every weekend. He says, when we were at Victory, we don't see what we see at Victory, what you see every single weekend. We don't see that in the churches across America. We've been in 80 churches from California to Minnesota to Michigan to New York to uh, Florida to Texas, back up to Ohio. We, we don't see what we just saw. A church with energy, a church with excitement, a church where there's health that's systemic all the way down. And can I just brag on you for a moment? Thank you, first of all, for that. But then secondly, we average on a given weekend between, between 10 and 12 first-time guests. Now, if you watch this big word that I learned from an accountant one time at a big church, if you extrapolate that out, <laughs> you like that, don't you? you know, write this down. I'm using it correctly too, Mrs. Warren. When you extrapolate out 10 to 12 first-time guests a weekend, we're seeing between five and 600 first-time guests a year. We want them to come back then. We want them to feel that this is a church where their spiritual and their family needs can be met. And so we want to make sure that from our parking lot to our greeting to our hospitality, they feel, <coughs> excuse me, more than welcomed because we want them to come back. We don't want it just to be a, a spiritual, emotional, like, woo, that was awesome, and then they descend into their world and they don't know what to do next. 
So what we want to do is provide some next steps too. And so Pastor Dan, would you please make your way one more time. Put your hands together for this man, Pastor Dan. And uh, Pastor Dan, would, would you just kind of, uh, he was telling me this morning, this is exciting to hear, just kind of an update on how our Family Life Ministry is doing. And, and uh, man, I've been so impressed with not only your, your organization and your detail, but your enthusiasm. So how are our, how are our kids and students doing? Well, dude, first and foremost, our kids are doing awesome. So give yourselves a big round of applause for our kids doing awesome kids ministry. So it's, it's, it's an honor and, and a privilege to be part, a, a very small part of kids ministry. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to, to talk a little about kids ministry. Uh, and we talked about knowing God, we talked about growing in God, and we talked about showing uh, God's love to the world. Uh, and we said that our, our mission in kids ministry is to bring kids to a new victory in Christ Jesus. And then that next step is to have them live and victory through Christ Jesus. We talked about, again, three, three driving principles is to know them, know God, to show God, and then to grow and, and show the world God. So we're doing a really awesome job of that. And so we're having a few format changes because did anyone here go to kids camp beside me? Did anyone go to kids camp? Throw your hand up real quick. Was that awesome and amazing with the energy and the excitement? Yeah, you can clap for that because it was awesome. Um, the energy and the excitement and what the teachers and what the leaders did was second to none. I mean, I was, I was excited when I came out and I learned a lot and it was an amazing time for not only the adults, but the kids as well. So we're trying to capture some of the energy. So over the next few weeks, what you're going to see in kids ministry is we're going to try to capture some of that kids camp excitement energy to create a fun, exciting, ener energetic ministry where the central part is, is Jesus. Because if Jesus isn't in the center of it, it doesn't make a difference, Right? So we're creating that fun, energetic, excitement place where they can meet Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're starting to transform um, some of the rooms in the back. So if you have an opportunity, the first room we're going to make is a game room. So we're going to have gaming systems. We're going to have uh, iPads. We're going to have worship music. We're going to have disco balls. We're going to have all kinds of stuff to make it fun and exciting. So the kids will come in, and, and they're going to have fun, exciting times. And what it is, it's just a time for us to connect with the kids, to get down their level, eye to eye, and just talk to the kids and listen to the kids and get into the world and make church a fun and exciting place to be. And then we'll walk back into the other room where we're going to have a, a time of prayer. We're going to have what we call big giving. So that's teaching them about tithe. And that's, there's going to be a big giving challenge where Pastor Dan's going to have to shave his head or turn it pink or something. I don't know. Um, but we're going to have some fun with big giving challenge to teach them that it's fun and exciting to be generous um, toward God. And then there'll be a message on the... Um, on the TV that we're going to go over a video message and then we're going to come up and we're going to have a little small group and explain or expand on that. We're going to have a motions team. So if you love uh, worship, we're going to have opportunity for a student motion team. We're going to have skits and improv. We're also going to have puppet shows because we have people here do puppetry. Um, so we're going to make it fun and exciting. Then we'll go back into the game room again uh, and end our day with another time of connect where we can just get on the kids' level again and love on them and meet them exactly where they are and listen to them and get into their world. Because it's not throwaway time in the kids' ministry. It's not babysitting time. It's not childcare time. It's time where we plant seeds and we sow seeds there. It's a time where we build up. Because in that room is going to be the next uh, pastors. They're going to be the next missionaries. They're going to be the next doctors and lawyers and teachers. And presidents are going to be in that room. And if we don't sow into them, somebody will. Right? We're creating a legacy. Yeah, you can clap for that. Somebody clap for that. There you go. That's cool. I'll take it. Um, we're creating a legacy. Right? What we do today is going to create a legacy tomorrow because those kids are going out into the world to spread the good news and make disciples. And if we don't pour into them, the world will. Right? So we're creating a legacy each and every Sunday, each and every day at home. You're creating a legacy with your kids or your grandkids or your neighbor's kids. So we need to put first things first, and that's putting Jesus Christ in the center of everything we do and everything we say. And after we buy into following the example of Christ, do we need to become that, that example of Christ? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Pastor Dan, on a practical level, what, what do you need? How many vol more volunteers? You have between 50 and probably 60 current volunteers. How many more volunteers do you need? Okay, let me ask a quick question. How many people like to have fun? Come on. How many people like to have fun? How many people like to play games? How many people like to laugh? 
Okay, I expect to see all of you coming to see me after service is over because we need you. Because we're looking for about 10 to 15 more kids volunteers to just go and meet kids where they are. Again, uh, the teaching, I'm doing the teaching, and we have a okay, couple so select teachers. Yeah, let's clarify that. So what we're looking for is people who just want to have fun and energetic and be with the kids. You've got the teaching part down. So we've kind of began to, to streamline things where it's more like, hey, I want to have fun and connect with kids and, and almost be, you know, their best friends back there. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for a thank few you. minutes. We'll well, thank you, everybody. Service. I love hearing that. So we want to see between uh, eight and ten people to help with the parking lot greeting team, people on the worship team, 10, 15 new volunteers in our kids and family life ministry and our student ministry. And as you begin to do that, again, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. When you're serving, it's hard to get stolen. So I believe in the example of Jesus, then I become the example of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And say this with me. Say, stay salty. <laughs> I'm going to say it once, and I'm not looking at my teenagers. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If you're not salty, you're not good. Is what the Word of God says. Let's skip down a few verses, Eric. Verse number 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says, I want to see your good works so they can glorify my Father in heaven. In other words, you have a responsibility to leverage the relationships that you have influence over. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to leverage the relationships that I've been entrusted with, to leverage that influence to invite them to come be a part of what God is doing in my life. Amen? That responsibility is a heavy burden. It's a responsibility. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to, I want to pray for you. And uh, I don't know if this is uh, um, church legal, but I'm going to ordain you this morning. Can we do that? Pastor Steve, is that, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this or not. I don't know. Shaking your head. No, I don't know if we can do it or not. So, so I can commission. Yeah, I want, I want, to, I want to make you this. I want to make you the reverend of your row. Can we do that? I want to make you the reverend of your row. And I want to close with this. I got a couple minutes here left. Last weekend, uh, a, a family walked up to me and they said, Andy, would you, would you just come here for just a moment? And I said, yeah. They said, we want to introduce you to somebody. And I said, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. And they said, we want to meet, I, I want you to meet the couple that will be sitting with us from now on. I said, oh, I love this because this is what I'm preaching on next week. <laughs> here we go. I got a great thank you, Lord, for that example. They said, we've been inviting them for several months, and we've, we've been praying for them, and, and our, our paths intersected, and they, they said, you know, they're a young couple, 24, 25, they, and they happened to mention that they, you know, we mentioned that he's a, uh, on, on the worship team, and um, they said, oh, really, you guys go to church somewhere? And they said, yeah, and they said, well, we, we've been looking for a church. We just haven't found one, and, the, and they invited them to come to be a part of our church here at Victory, and they came last weekend, and one of the comments that they made was, this is exactly what we've been looking for. Do you know there are people looking for what you take for granted every single Sunday? And what you need to do is you need to realize the responsibility that you have with the relationship that you have because you have influence in those relationships. And if you'll simply leverage that influence and invite someone to come be a part of what God is doing, I want to make you a reverend this morning. You're a reverend of your row. Now, you can't marry anybody, you know. <laughs> And you're not taking my salary. Um, so here's what I want to do. Many of you, you, you may say this. Well, the reverend, what does that mean? The reverend of my row. Well, the very first row that I'm a reverend of, if you could please slide down just a little bit, is this first row right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is my row. I love my wife. Hey, beautiful. Mm -hmm. This is my row. Yeah. This is my incredible Emma two times. Two times. That's Gabe and Emma and we have our very first child in college. I feel like we've done a really nice job parenting her. Um, she's, she's now out of the nest. It's okay, she's coming home Friday. <laughs> 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 I 
That's the first row that I'm a reverend of. And I look, I look one row back and I see Pastor Steve and, and Steve Brennan and his wife Liz in their row. That's, that's the row there. He's the reverend over that row. I look in the back row and I see the Tom's family. And Jeff is the reverend of that row first. Now what I want you to begin to pray though is that I want you, and we're going to say this out loud in a minute, I'm the reverend of my row. I will invest and invite and pray that it will grow. Because a few weeks ago, we had a family walk in here and they had three rows. Three rows! I thought, oh my goodness, you got one row, two rows, three rows, this is awesome. I am the reverend of my row. I will invest and invite and pray that it will grow. How amazing would it be if you helped me If you helped our pastoral staff, if you helped our staff, when you saw someone that was absent from church and you said, whoa, whoa, they've been sitting in my row. That's a (laughs) no-no to miss church two or three weeks in a row. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I want you to know this, though. Now, listen, and you know me well enough. Um, we, are, we are the least judgmental or, condem, you know, or, or condemning people. If you miss a week or two or it's been summer, listen, if you have, a, if you have a, a boat and you have access to a lake, enjoy it. Because you know this. Summer is like that in Ohio. Enjoy it. But if you're just being lazy, that's wrong. And so if you have people that you know that they've, they've, they've sat near your row or you say, now this is, this is now my row. I want, to, I want to invest and invite and pray that it will grow. Then I want you to get involved in the world and you to message and say, hey, listen, is, is there something between you and Jesus? Is there something between you and victory? Do you have something going on that you can't make it a priority to come be a part of what God is doing in, in, our, in our church? You invest in your row. And then you pray that your row will grow. Amen? Would you stand with me? So I guess Steve said I can't officially ordain you, but I can commission you. <laughs> but I can make you a reverend. So, uh, so gentlemen, if you want to, if you want to encourage your wife to call you reverend the rest of the afternoon, I guess it. This is this this is like Snapchat. We'll keep it up for 24 hours. I'm a reverend now. Okay, I want you to say this. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just. Um, but I, I want to make this a declaration of a decision that you make today that could be huge and pay huge dividends. I want you to begin to pray that, God, would you entrust me with people in my row that possibly could could begin to come to church because of me and enjoy it? So we're going to repeat this out loud. I am am the reverend of my row. row. I will invite and invest invest. and pray that it will grow. grow. One more time. I am am the reverend of my row. I will invite and invest and pray that it will grow. Amen? Amen. Now, I want you to look at your row. Look at your row. Her growth is probably the best of all of us in the room. We're going to pray that our rows grow. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, today I pray in Jesus' name, help Dana's row to grow. Help all of our rows to see growth. But God, that means that we need to leave the comforts of our own personal space and our own personal zones and and shoot the text. Stop by the house. Make the phone call. Send the message and say, "I, I miss you. How can I pray for you? How can I get inside of your world and let you know that God has a plan for you to overcome your hurt, to overcome what you're going through? God, Commission us today. Let us know that you have a plan for us to build and grow our church. And that first step could be with, with, with serving or with just simply praying for that, that family that we know has been absent or that family we know has been looking for a church. I thank you for this opportunity to become a reverend of a row, to invest and invite and pray that it will grow. In Jesus' name, and we all shout it back. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. God bless you.